Okay, our final speaker is Dr. Andrew Baker from the University of Miami Erasmus. Great. Thanks, Tom. Thanks, uh, Allison. So I'm going to be talking today about the uh, intersection between coral reef restoration and climate change. This is obviously a very uh, relatively new but very rapidly growing area of research. And I just want to point out right from the outset that a lot of the kinds of things that we've been hearing about uh, from assisted evolution to reef 2.0 to stress hardening, all of these um, ideas and, and attempts that are being proposed, they all rely on coral restoration ultimately as an ingredient in being able to uh, scale up those efforts and ultimately uh, have an impact on the fate of coral reefs. So I think it's really important to, to keep that in mind. Um, we all know that uh, climate change is having devastating impacts on reefs around the world, um, not just uh, far afield, but locally here in Florida as well. Uh, and I think the last two to three years, uh, it's fair to say, have seen the worst coral bleaching episodes on record, not just for the severity of the bleaching, uh, some places in the Central Pacific seeing degree heating weeks that were far in excess of anything that's been recorded to date, but also in the back-to-back -back bleaching episodes that we've started to see, not just here in Florida, but in Hawaii and in Australia. And these back-to-back -back events have long been predicted uh, through climate models and, and so on, but this is the first time that we're really starting to see these things. And so the topic of my talk today um, or sorry, before I get into that, obviously bleaching um, is, uh, is part of a continuum. Bleached corals are not dead corals, um, and corals can recover from bleaching. Whether they recover from bleaching and are the same as they were before or whether they're different is sort of a topic of this talk. Um, but I want to point out that the, the transitions between a coral being a healthy coral through to being a bleached coral and the reversibility of this, where it can recover and become healthy again, Ultimately, the kinds of things that determine whether a coral are, corals are resistant to bleaching or whether they're particularly resilient to bleaching and can bounce back again depend to a large degree, as well as on other factors, on the, the genetic variation, both inter- and intraspecific, in both the coral host and its algal symbionts. And so uh, the topic of this talk is really to focus on uh, can we exploit that genetic variation, that inherent genetic variability, to develop intervention strategies that will intersect with restoration efforts uh, to help us conserve coral reefs in the face of climate change. And what I'm going to focus on today, uh, this is a big topic, this is not, uh, the idea here is not to give a big overview of everything that's going on, there's just not enough time to do that, but to talk about some of the efforts that we're doing here in South Florida uh, that fall into this category, and they, they fall into this, this sort of realm that I've called, or calling genetic redistribution, which is manipulating existing uh, spatial distributions uh, of uh, genetic variability or combinations of genotypes for symbiotic organisms like corals uh, into areas where they do not commonly occur. They, they may be there, but they're just not that high abundance. And so ways in which we can use uh, genetic redistribution to deal with climate change include things like symbiont manipulation, and I'm here referring to the algal symbionts principally, the zooxanthellae that are inside corals. Um, and the idea is, uh, can we boost the abundance of certain types of Zozanthelli, certain types of symbiodinium that are heat tolerant um, in ways in which we can uh, increase the abundance of these symbionts in areas where they're rare or absent and allow corals to survive warmer temperatures. And I'm also going to talk, if I have time, a little bit about assisted migration, which, or sometimes it's called assisted colonization, which is colonization, which is relocating coral genotypes uh, from sites that are characterized by uh, warmer conditions to sites where uh, conditions are currently cooler, but which are expected to warm in the near future. So it's all of these sort of fall into the category of preparing corals for climate change. And under assisted migration, you can kind of also include selective breeding or sometimes called assisted evolution of corals, because they share in common that it, it requires identifying sources and sinks, populations that are pre-adapted to warmer temperatures and uh, sites where they would be best suited to be located. So first of all, talking about symbiont manipulation, um, you know, conventional wisdom is that this is not going to be an easy thing. Corals are often uh, seen as not simple model systems for this kind of uh, study of symbiotic uh, partnerships. They're slow growing. They're environmentally very sensitive. That's part of the problem, obviously. Um, they're difficult or impossible to make symbiont free or completely symbiont free. And it's often difficult to characterize the symbiotic milieu of a coral in absolute terms. Um, there's uh, often high degree of symbiont specificity. Corals do have preferences for certain types of symbionts. Uh, 
Uh, there's some flexibility to that, however. And there are obviously protected species, making them even more difficult to work on. However, we do know that coral bleaching naturally uh, can promote changes in algal symbiont communities, uh, sort of on its own. And we know that reefs uh, recovering from mass coral bleaching events uh, do uh, sometimes recover with these more heat tolerant symbionts in greater abundance as a result of the bleaching event that they've been through. And so we might naturally ask the question, can we increase the thermal tolerance of corals by sort of inoculating corals with heat tolerant symbionts? And for some time, we, we tried investigating these possibilities in, in my own lab uh, in Miami. And unfortunately, the general answer to this question is no. Uh, it's actually very difficult to directly treat corals using algal inoculates to actually uh, cause these corals to pick up and acquire these symbionts and gain thermal tolerance as a result. Those, these methods tend to be generally ineffective. However, uh, by studying natural coral bleaching events around the world and by doing controlled experiments in the lab, what we have learned is that the types of symbionts that recover in corals after a bleaching event do, do, do depend on the bleaching severity and the recovery temperature that these corals are exposed to. And so in a few experiments in the lab, we've been able to sort of tie this down by artificially, uh, experimentally bleaching corals to various degrees. We're causing them to lose between 60 and 80% of their symbionts. Um, so these are categorized as low levels of bleaching, medium levels, and high levels of bleaching. And then we've recovered them at different temperatures. And what we've seen is that the abundance of different types of symbionts that recover in these corals after bleaching really depends on the interaction between the bleaching severity and the recovery temperature. And these symbionts here in shaded in dark are the members of clade D symbiodinium symbionts that are often associated with heat tolerance. And you can see that when you bleach coral severely and you raise them at warmer temperatures, corals recover with more and more of these D-related symbionts. And these patterns are uh, sort of uh, generic to a number of different coral species, with some coral species being more able to undergo these changes than others. Uh, here's an example with Orbicella fabulata showing kind of a similar trajectory, where until you have both uh, high bleaching and warmer temperatures, you tend not to see much change until you actually see quite large amounts of change in favor of these heat tolerance environments. But other species undergo those changes much more readily, like Sideraster Sidorea. Uh, you all you need to do is give it a, a whiff of the right conditions and it, they quickly uh, turn over to being dominated by these heat tolerance environments. And these heat tolerance environments really do have a benefit to their coral hosts. They, they increase heat tolerance by somewhere between one and a half degrees and two degrees centigrade, which doesn't sound like a lot, but that's enough to get them through the sort of projections for the current century of, of climate change. Here's an experiment that graduate students in my lab did where we bleached corals and monitored their photochemical efficiency, which is kind of a proxy for how badly bleached they're becoming. And you can see that over a 10 day period where we expose them to 32 degrees centigrade, their photochemical efficiency crashes. And then slowly when we release them from that heat stress, they recover and their photochemical efficiency returns to normal, as does their pigmentation. But when we hit them with a second bleaching event, and I should say that the corals that we bleached recovered with uh, virtual dominance by these heat tolerant symbionts, whereas the control corals stayed with the same original symbionts that they had. When we hit them with a second bleaching event, all of those corals that we uh, manipulated to contain this D1A heat tolerance symbiont no longer bleach at 32 degrees centigrade. And in fact, the only corals that bleach are the control corals that we didn't do anything the first time around with. And these results, this, this increase of you know, one to two degrees centigrade, match other results from other parts of the world. Australia, using similar type D symbionts, have seen similar, similar results. So these data indicate that possibly through controlled bleaching and recovery, uh, you could manipulate, you can manipulate uh, coral symbiont communities and ultimately increase coral thermal tolerance. Um, so this is an example of something that we might call stress hardening. Uh, it's an example of hormesis, biological term meaning the induction of a beneficial response uh, in an organism through exposure to a fairly low dose of a stressor that would in, in high doses be extremely uh, harmful or even lethal. A uh, good example would be sort of vaccinations or inoculations where we, we deliberately expose our bodies to uh, an anti uh, to a, a, a microbe that would ordinarily cause a, a, you know, us a great deal of harm, but we trigger a natural biological response that protects us in future from uh, the effects of that uh, exposure. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so one potential application would be, uh, you could think about stress hardening, uh, small, fast growing coral colonies, the kinds of colonies that are being grown in nurseries uh, today, um, and seed these outplanted corals with small amounts of these thermal tolerance inwards, and then see whether there's an increase in the thermal tolerance of your outplants after you've done that. And uh, recently, my lab uh, uh, won a prize to become the inventors in residence at the new Frost Science Museum in, in, in Miami, so it's kind of a local plug. Reva Winter, who's now a curator at this museum, is a co-inventor in residence, and we have this lab where we'll be doing public experiments, um, uh, actually stress hardening corals for outplanting uh, right off of uh, Miami Beach. Um, and uh, part of this effort, you know, ultimately involves uh, collaborators at the University of Miami, principally Diego Learman, who as many of you know, we've been, has been growing uh, corals in Miami-Dade County for several years. And so the goal here is to try to avoid, mitigate, or reduce the levels of coral bleaching that Diego and his colleagues have been seeing in outplanted corals as a result of, for example, the bleaching events that we've seen in 2014 and 2015 where uh, corals that are outplanted uh, bleach and ultimately uh, die. And so ultimately the goal is here, can we uh, increase the efficiency of coral restoration so that we're not simply outplanting the next set of climate victims. So stress hardening of corals involves experimentally bleaching the corals to remove the symbionts, let them recover with heat tolerance symbionts, and then uh, uh, test whether they've in fact been stress hardened as all of our experimental results in the labor laboratory indicate. But how do we uh, scale this up from laboratory to the reef? The idea here is not to try to bring corals back to the lab and stress harden them by their thousand in labs. I think that would just be too time consuming and, and not, not easy to scale. So what we're, uh, you know, the, the principal challenges here are, um, can we stress harden these fast growing, thin skinned staghorn corals that tend to be relatively vulnerable to bleaching. They don't have a lot of tissue resources to survive bleaching vents, unlike many other massive coral species. Um, so we have some experiments ongoing right now at UM where we've done that and these public experiments in the Frost Science Museum that I mentioned. But then how do we scale the, up these endeavors? And the idea is to bleach corals in the field uh, rather than bring them back to the lab. And so uh, many of you will know that you can bleach corals very effectively using high light, not just high temperature. And so the idea is as part of these nursery activities is to expose corals during the warmest time of the year, which is coming up right now, to high levels of solar irradiance using these subsurface bleaching rafts. And then after a week or so of that treatment to return them back to their uh, natural depth and grow, grow them out, see what happens to the symbiont communities and measure their stress tolerance. Um, so this is just a schematic that shows you can collect fragments from nurseries, either bleach them in the lab or bleach them in the field using highlight and then plant them back out again. And we're lucky enough that we have the opportunity to essentially uh, do a sort of clinical trial of this uh, as part of a grant from NOAA's Office of Habitat Restoration with Diego Learman and myself. Uh, this was a grant that was focusing on coastal resilience, but as part of this uh, effort, which is planting out 10,000 corals off of uh, Miami Beach and Key Biscayne, uh, 1,600 of those corals are gonna be involved in this stress hardening sort of clinical trial to determine uh, whether it works, what the trade-offs are, are there, are there changes in growth, changes in reproductive output, how long do these symbionts remain, all those kinds of questions that, that I'm sure you guys have. Um, and yeah, as I, as I mentioned, this is really a demonstration project to look at the wave attenuation capacity of, of corals and their ability of restored reefs to protect coastlines from, from harm. So what are we learning from these symbiont manipulations? Well, direct treatment with isolated algal inoculates doesn't work. Um, or at least works only under very special circumstances. Um, we can fairly routinely stress harden these corals to change their symbionts now. Three or four species have been done to date. Um, we can also, I didn't talk about it here, but manipulate uh, massive corals and the symbionts in there using tissue plugs as vectors that we bring back to the lab and change the symbionts in. And there's some interesting avenues that can be pursued there. And so this has some value for reef restoration efforts by stress hardening. Um, and you know, it has inherent scientific value because it allows us to control for the effect of coral genotype while still changing symbionts, which is interesting for coral biologists like myself. Um, and it also helps understand what is already happening on these reefs, which is the, the spread of thermotolerant symbionts throughout the Caribbean, and in particular, one type of symbiodinium clade D1A, sometimes called symbiodinium trenchi. 
Um, and so this will help us, this effort will help us to understand what the natural consequences of that might be and what the trade-offs are. And so I'm going to tie up very briefly with a little few comments on assisted migration and the work that we're doing here. This is an area, again, uh, where there have been some really interesting papers in the, in the recent past. Um, and what these papers have done is sort of allowed us to think about what the potential benefits of assisted migration might be, the relocation of, of corals from warm areas to cooler areas that are expected to warm. But what they haven't really done is, is let us think about how do we prioritize where to act and how do we minimize risks, risks such as you know, hitchhiking microbes and, and other um, metazoan organisms that might introduce invasive species or possibly diseases, the kinds of things that, that people think about when we talk about uh, moving corals over relatively large distance, more than a few tens of kilometers, let's say. And one pragmatic solution to those concerns is, is simply to try to minimize the distance over which we move these corals to start with. And so one way of pragmatically doing that is to try to identify where temperature gradients are steepest. And in particular, where temperature gradients are steepest, taking into account climate model projections for the effects of future warming. And another solution might also be to translocate things in stages, doing them over the periods of years to a decade or two, moving them a few tens of kilometers at a time and monitoring what happens. And these are the kinds of questions that I think we need to start thinking about. And so in, in collaboration with a colleague of mine at NOAA, Ruben Van Huydonk, we've been looking at where you might do that in this part of the world. And you can look at simple things like the maximum monthly mean of the, uh, of the climatology, and this gives you pictures like this. There's nothing new here where you can see that corals are naturally exposed to warmer conditions during the summertime um, than in some places than others. Um, but what Ruben has been doing uh, more recently is using statistical downscaling approaches to look at uh, small scale variation in the model projections for these areas in terms of the amount of warming that they're going to see. And looking at this metric called the time to annual severe bleaching, which is the time to where we're going to see or projected to see repeated back to back bleaching events. And so uh, what this uh, does when you use this methodology for say the Florida reef tract, um, you can see that in Florida, the time to the onset of annual severe bleaching varies across the Florida reef tract from between about 2035 to about 2055, depending on where you are. You can see that the extremes of distribution down here are bleaching more quickly on a repeated basis, in, both in the south and in the north, but there's a little more time in the middle keys. You can see where we're out to about 2055. Um, but you can also play with this data to, to sort of model what would happen if you moved corals from one site to another. And interestingly, if you move corals from different parts of the Florida Keys, from the, the lower to the middle or the middle to the upper, you don't actually gain a huge amount of time because the thermal gradients here are not particularly steep. You might gain up to about 10 years of thermal tolerance. Uh, so the time to annual severe bleaching is increased by less than 10 years in most cases. However, there are some interesting um, patterns here. Um, it turns out if you translocated corals from the Middle Keys to Miami Beach or focusing in on this area, even from the northern end of Biscayne National Park up to Miami Beach, you could gain more than 20 years of thermal tolerance, which you know, I think it was Tom mentioned earlier on, this is about buying time. And these are the kinds of activities where this is a small scale movement of a few tens of kilometers. But by being smart about how, we're, how and where we're moving corals from and to, I think uh, we can uh, uh, help inject some, some time delays into the system. And interestingly, there are also some other uh, gradients worth mentioning. Uh, if you translocated corals from the south coast of Cuba, from uh, the gardens of the Queen over to the north uh, coast here, close to the gardens of the King, you would actually gain about 45 years of additional thermal tolerance by, by doing that. And you know, while this might cause us some alarm, you know, literally trucking corals across the island, there are other ways that we might consider doing this. We might consider moving them from this area in steps along this sort of staged withdrawal into the cooler areas. Um, and so, uh, so we gain about 45 years here, but we would also, if we were to consider this, either through the movement of corals or through the crossbreed of corals, potentially gain about 20 years uh, by comparing the middle and lower keys to the, the south coast of Cuba. So what's the ongoing work? Uh, I won't spend too much time on here because we're running out of time. Um, there's a, a lot of different work uh, going on uh, in my lab with various students and postdocs, and I, I won't read these out. Um, but my, my reasoning in 
showing you these different avenues of research is to point out to the younger members of this audience, students and so on, that, that there's a lot of work that can be done. And uh, sometimes you'll hear that, you know, things like coral reefs, are maybe ecosystems that are not worth working on, they're on their way out. But actually, I think coral reef ecosystems, there's no better time to be working on these systems because there's so much at stake. Um, and so sort of final thoughts here is that, you know, we have to maintain our hope. I think restoration is a critical part of the kinds of activities that can be done to help save coral reefs in the face of climate change. The, the tools that the pioneers of restoration have developed over the last decade or two are going to be really critical, everything from uh, coral gardening to coral landscaping. Um, and ultimately, we have to uh, learn to balance the costs of doing nothing and sort of monitoring what's going on with our fear of doing something. Uh, and ultimately, what that something turns out to be is something that we as a community have to figure out what we're comfortable with. And But my point really in giving a talk like this now is that we have to start this work now. If we wait until the situation gets any worse, we'll have drastically reduced our, our options. So I'm going to end there and just uh, um, uh, really um, want to thank my funding sources and all the various people. Uh, these are PhD students in my lab who've been involved in these projects over the last five or 10 years, uh, and also all the students and undergrads and postdocs that are currently in the lab that are hopefully going to move some of these things forward because I don't do any of this actually myself. Um, <laughs> so uh, uh, thank you very much. And I guess we can move to.